I'm not used to speaking with the microphone, so if I fade away <laughs> or get too loud, please signal me. My name is Bud Anderson. I'm delighted you came tonight to spend your time with me and our group and learn about the subject of the unintended consequences of hand. So I'm going to have just a really brief, if anybody has community announcements, because I did get one request. Yeah. Would you? Uh, the League of Women Voters on Monday, September 16th, so 7 to 8.30, they're going to have a Voting security and what's being done statewide, locally, to safeguard our voting system and to implement the new state voting laws. So, I've been trying to talk about it everywhere. Thank you. Uh, any other short community announcements? Yeah. Okay, very briefly, I'm going to do some introductions. Our leader for the last few years, Tracy Powell, I have a ton of respect for him. He works hard to make our world better. Thank you, Tracy. I'll give you a, just a brief background on myself. Um, I was born in Detroit during World War II. My dad sat on an enemy aircraft gun in Seattle during the war. And after the war, he took his family from Detroit, moved us to Seattle, and that's been my home ever since. I, I'm kind of a, a really geeky technical guy, sort of. At least that's what I think I am. Like, if you have me write things, you'll think a fifth grader wrote it. You know, I can't write, I can't spell. I, but if you ask me to do math, I can get from A to B. So uh, I worked at the Shell Refinery as an electrical engineer for 44 years, retired 2016. But my wife, Jackie, who's sitting up here in the front, she knows all I do is read history or watch history. That's just, for whatever reason, I really enjoy history. And I find nonfiction is really fascinating, way more than fiction. So I just, um, Read nonfiction. I like facts. I like data. I love it when there's pictures. Uh, I don't like it when there's just opinion or somebody remembering what happened 2,000 years ago. You know that just bores me. But so I'm so I've done as a kid when I grew up. There was a P-47 pilot in the war that lived next to us, um, and I was just fascinated by his war stories and, and everything. And but part of the thing was in school, we were taught to duck and cover. Now. Raise your hand if you actually ducked and covered. Who did that? Just about, you didn't do that. Okay, most schools in the U.S. did that. Now, I knew that was because, you know, Russia, the horrible people were gonna come over and bomb us. And, but I didn't really know why we were doing that. You know, remember, you go under your table, you put one arm back here so that the flying glass didn't cut your neck, and one arm here, blind you, but why would you be blind? Well, those things would happen because a nuclear weapon would go off. And they are so devastating. It's, you know, you see pictures, but you really can't imagine how devastating they are. They're horrific. So our group is dedicated to eliminating nuclear weapons in the world. We do not expect to get that job done tomorrow or the next day, but we're going to do our share, and we're going to try. If you are sympathetic to where we are and where we're going, and want to hear about us, we have a sign-up sheet in the back for emails. And you just put your name, your email down, and you'll get all our information that comes out regularly. Tracy puts out a super good monthly summary. If you don't want to join a group anymore or get tired, just, just tell Tracy and off you go. We wish you the best. There's two other pamphlets back there. One is describing No More Bombs, our group. So if you want to know a little bit more about us. There it is. And the other one, and this is going to be a topic for our next presentation. Now, we'll send out an email to those of you who have signed up. And on November 4th, here, 7 o'clock, I'm going to give a talk. And it's sort of centered on this, but it's going to go into some, some other um, topics. So we have nuclear weapons. How did we get them? How we have used them? How many there are? What's their status? What are we going to do with them now? That'll be the topic November 4th. 
Our group plans to have quarterly meetings here, and uh, we'll just make those announcements as they come. So a year ago, I'm, I'm part of a couple groups, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility and Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility. And the Oregon group gets blocks of tickets to Hanford Tours. Now Hanford's a fascinating place, it's huge. Most of us probably know where it is and have a general idea how big it is, it's huge. So I went two years ago by myself. There's three tours of Hanford. One is a tour that shows the original buildings like the old schoolhouse, the town of White Bluffs, the different farm communities, very interesting. The other tour is the end reactor, pardon me, the B reactor, B reactor. And it focuses strictly on the B reactor. You go in the B reactor, you spend half the day looking at all parts of it. It's a great educational tour. The B reactor produced the first industrial scale plutonium, Hanford, Washington. That was produced at Hanford. So um, my topic is not nuclear bombs, but the uranium bomb made an Oak Ridge. They, but they took uranium to Hanford and through a radiation process converted some of the uranium to plutonium because plutonium could give you a much bigger bang, much. All that was originally developed at Hanford, Washington. So on the tour the second year, I, I got a few folks to go with me, my wife Jackie, by the way, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. Thank you. She puts up with me. Julia Hurd went with us. And Kathleen Flanagan, who isn't here. So as I give my talk, we're going to kind of go through a whole process of history. I think it's better if you have questions to go ahead and ask them, as long as they're not too involved. Because what will happen is we're going to go from subject to subject, and you might lose track. If you, if you have a question, please. So this is informal. I want to be your friend, I want you to be my friend. Let's just exchange information. So with that, if I could have the lights, Tracy. The intended consequences of atomic bombs were to do this. Now I'm not here to discuss this, but our group thinks this is wrong. This is Hiroshima. 1944. And in the talk on November 4th, we'll talk about who's got weapons now. Now these numbers were much, much bigger before um, they were reduced wisely. Russia currently has about 6,500, the U.S. six. And you can read the numbers. These are all the states that have nuclear weapons, France, China, UK, Pakistan, Pakistan, India, Israel, Korea. Actually, we're missing one, South Africa, but they are the only country in the world that has eliminated their nuclear weapons. I put this in, it's got a lot of detail info, again on the November 4th talk, but Let's take a look at the two weapons. Little Boy, which was the uranium one, the one developed at Oak Ridge. 10,000 pound bomb. The target's 140 pounds. She had an 85 pound, let's call it projectile, and a target, 55 pounds. You put those together very quickly, 140 pounds, it blew up. One and a half percent of the fuel fissioned, and the first slide showed what happened when that happened. Nowadays, weapons are much bigger and much more efficient. The, the first bomb ever exploded in New Mexico and the one dropped at Nagasaki is the Fat Man bomb, 10,000 bomb. It was a circle, and it was a really interesting material. It's plutonium made at Hanford. So you take a softball size of plutonium, say 13 pounds, you compress it to a tennis ball size, and you get an enormous explosion. This one was about, I think it's 21,000 tons of TNT. 
and it only used 1.1 grams of material. So this is a map of Hanford, Washington. Seattle and Cortis Way up here. You drive in, you can drive through the State Highway 240, it does go through the area. But the thing to note here is all the reactors that were built during World War II and after, right along the river, because they used an enormous amount of cooling water, nuclear reaction generates unbelievable amounts of heat. So being close to the Columbia River was, was one of the ideal locations. And then after they put uranium in here and changed it to plutonium, they process it, chemically extracted it, the material, essentially in the 200 West area. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And later on, developed other plants in the 200 East area. Okay, so us four friends showed up at the Visitor Information Center. You'll notice that that's National Park. So National Park Service, Manhattan Project National Park, very nice, very organized. The first tour we went on, the end reactor, uh, pretty easy to get on and you didn't have to uh, do too much security. The, the uh, cleanup tour was a different story. Oh, did I, say, I keep saying yeah, I don't know why. B reactor. So you get on an air-conditioned bus, it drives you quite a few miles to the site, and this is the B reactor. And here we are going in. Where's the visitor center in relation to this? Okay, um, I'm going to go back. The visitor center is right, let me get it, right here. Okay. You're actually on 240 headed out, okay. right about there. Yeah. This is a picture of the reactor, the B reactor and support facilities. This is actually the reactor, water towers, a lot of water processing, so deaerators, demineralizers, huge buildings to process the water, huge electrical system, massive amounts of water pumped in and pumped out to keep things cool, and the support <coughs> facilities. Incidentally, all this has been taken down, which is a credit to, Ham to Hanford, except the B reactor. What's easy about that is these are essentially not nuclear contained facilities, but the B reactor is. So when you're inside the B reactor, there's Julia, there's Jackie. We are sitting just like you guys are now. This is a great picture. And you're looking at the reactor. There's 2,004 tubes. Each one of these is a tube going through the reactor. This was called a work loading platform, but they actually loaded the tubes, oh, I'll show you in another slide, but like this. They, they put the material in the reactor here. The cooling water manifolds are all here, bringing cooling water across the reactor and then through each of the 2004 tubes. And it was vital that all of them worked. So another view straight on. Here's the work platform. These are the tubes that contain uranium, and when they shut the reactor down, you'd pull the cap off, put in new material. The old material goes out the other end, and that material then goes to a whole other complex that chemically processes it, and the end product is plutonium. This is the front end of the facility in the same building, but this is the water pipes. It's a little hard to see scale, but these are huge pipes, huge valves. All this water's, after it's purified, demineralized, deaerated, is the water that keeps that from cooling down and, and potentially melting down. So this is how they load it. And I forgot the exact dimension here, but I think that's about 40 feet long. And so they, they load this with their material and then slide it in the selected tubes. 
they load the tubes up in this open area? Or they load it somewhere uh, they, they load it there. And I will show you how they do that in a minute. <clears throat> uh, just some interesting caution signs. I saw these, I thought, hmm. Now, if I worked there, I wouldn't place any part of my body or hands over any of the source positions. I would follow that sign. It's not like driving downtown, it says 35 and you go 40. Uh -uh. I would have paid attention. And I'd have paid attention to all these signs. Just really be careful because the material you're dealing with is deadly. And dead, it stays deadly for quite a while. So the tubes that we were talking about are these. And they're, I'm gonna give you a rough dimensions, two inches. And you have the stuff that goes, it's stuffed in there, it's about an inch and a half. And what these are, it looks just about like my microphone. So if we could turn the lights on just for a minute. In what they call the 300 area of the complex, they make fuel. And fuel is, is an aluminum sheathing like this, hollow, filled with uranium. It looks just like, there's a scale model of it. On the ends of the reactor, they don't want all this radioactivity to come pouring out so they have dummy tubes, the end one's filled with lead, I think, a variety of different dummy tubes. So you've got about eight of these, picture, these are the scale, I think it's eight and three eighths inches or something. You get eight of these blockers, then you get 32 of these active uranium ones, and then you get eight blockers and you put it on that long tube you saw, with the reactor shut down, you stick it in, then you turn the reactor back on. Thank you. Okay. What do you say? Turning on and off. Oh, okay, um, thank you. Um, and let me answer that in just a couple more slides because that's a little bit hard to answer. Oh, these are some of the fittings. The water fitting, this is the water fitting, the start of each of the tubes. That actually is one of the uranium, I mean, it doesn't have uranium in it, but that's a uranium canister. Can you guys hear me okay? Because I'm, okay, thank you. Uranium canister, or it would be a dummy. And that is actually part of the tube that it's shoved into. So this stuff, 32 of these plus eight plus eight, goes in here. Is that put in remotely? Or... Uh, no. <laughs> and, and I promise I'll get there. Um, I'm going to go back to answer both those questions. So, well actually, answer one of them. The reactor shut down, there's nine control rods that go in the side that are filled with boron. And boron eats neutrons. So, the reactor process is Neutrons are just flying all over the place and dividing and multiplying. And the, when you put the boron in, it absorbs them and the reactor doesn't, stays less than critical. It goes cold. And when it's cold, then you can, you don't have to keep the cooling water going. And these tubes up, they're all preloaded, ready to go. You put them in front and then there's, there's actually, I saw a mechanical device where they can jack them into the tubes. Now when you're doing that, the stuff that's already in there goes out the back end. And that's the product you're trying to get. There's Jackie sitting at the, that's actually the control of the reactor. First one in the world. That's yours truly. These are the six control rods. When those rods are inserted, the reactor's not active. When they're pulled out, it can get as active as you want it to get. 
and various other instrumentation. Now remember, this is in the 1940s. So if you were sitting in that chair and looked at this board, there's, I think these were temperature indicators going in and out of the reactor. Caution, bumping panel may cause scram. <laughs> Probably the first person that did it was sorry you did it. This is behind the control board. Now certainly nothing could go wrong there. <laughs> now, I worked in the refinery and uh, did a lot of maintenance work, but, but actually, given credit, it worked pretty well. I like this picture. This is an office. Slide rolls. I went to college in 1962, and I, one of my classes was a one credit class on how to use slide rolls. So the fuel's been in the reactor, it's time, it, they leave it in, let's say, a month or two. Okay, now it's got a little bit of plutonium, you want it to go out the back end. So they push the new one, well they shut the reactor down, push the new ones in, the old guys come out, hopefully don't get caught up here, hopefully fall in here. And this is water, and water contains the radioactivity. So these all come down here and they've got a little gate and they put them into buckets. Then they store them in here for a while to try to let some of the fast decaying radioactivity decay and then they move them. So after they, this is actually the water basin, they come out here, there's way scales, and they put them in these bins. And I think there's 240 in each bin. And then when it's time to transport them, they move them to a railroad car. And this is a different one, but this is the one that was used for the B reactor. There's three compartments in here with water. They're put in, I think, lead buckets and stuck in here and taken to the other area for chemical processing. Okay, now this is an overview of the area where they were taken for chemical processing. And this is the area where the contamination is severe. It's a little hard to see, but bear with me a little bit. In the beginning, they built three chemical processing plants, and these are huge. 800 feet long, 70 feet wide, 70 feet tall, and I'll show you a diagram of those. So just picture this, 800 foot long building. That's the tea plant, the first one constructed in the world. After that, the U plant, and after that, it's off here, but it's the B plant. And those were the three chemical processing plants at Hanford until in the 50s down here they built Redox, which is here. And then later they built Purex, plutonium uranium extraction, which is a huge plant over here. All five of those are in serious trouble. Worse, let's talk about tea plant. This first tank farm, 241T, these are all single shell tanks filled with radioactive contaminated material. There's a lot of other tank farms. Um, here's 241TY, you need more space. Here's 241TX. This is the original, this is 47, 48, 51, 52. These areas here, and, we'll, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. For example, 218W4A is where they dump material on the ground. There's 177 tanks in Hanford. And I, I can't remember, let's see, the exact number, but it's like 30 or double wall, the rest are single wall. So I, when I worked at Shell, um, 
Lots of people worry about corrosion in tanks. I was one of them. I did the cathodic protection for the refinery. And cathodic protection is electrically protecting any steel in the ground. And it's very good that it does that. For example, Cascade Natural Gas, all their lines are cathodically protected. The refinery that I left is 100% cathodically protected. Uh, any underground steel line. And what cathodic protection is, is electrically you can induce a current into the pipe and it'll prevent corrosion. But there is no cathodic protection here. Worse though is that what's in the, in the tanks. So they use nitric acid to dissolve the slugs and, and then they, of course, will try to neutralize it, but you've got this huge concoction of acid, base material, lots of metals, including uranium, plutonium, et cetera. So half-lives of these materials can be very long. Plutonium half-life is 24,000 years. So if I've got a handful of plutonium, it's gonna be half as strong radioactively speaking, in 24,000 years. So it takes 10 to 12 half cycles before you really reduce that to a more easily managed product. Uranium, and I, I need to get my notes on that, it's, it's, I think it's four billion years. Yes, um, half-life, Half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. Half-life of uranium-235 is 700 million years. So the problem with this material, it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. So therefore, we have to store it in a safe fashion. And I think Hanford was right on thinking that the safe way to store it is to vitrify it. So vitrifying would be essentially making glass. So let's say you have this blob of plutonium and you mix it with silica or whatever else and other chemicals and you melt it and then you let it cool and you've got this block of glass type material. So that would be the general concept of vitrification. And I think that's good. So let's see if we can get there. So in the chemical processing plants, so here's our tea plant, 800 feet long. This is a tunnel, a railroad tunnel, where the material enters the plant. And then it's processed through a series. And then it goes to this building for another chemical processing step. And then you have plutonium. Air circulation comes through this building. There's, I think, four huge fans here and goes out the stack. Hopefully, no one lives downwind. There's another view of T plant. This is the cross section of the plant. You have three galleries that elect all the electrical stuff. I'd love to go through this but they don't let you in. You have piping, operating gallery, so the operators would actually be here. And then you've got 40 of these cells where you have things like dissolvers, mixers, centrifuges that do the chemical processing, just like chemistry class on super steroids. And then the hot product goes through this product tent trench. Airborne contaminants, ventilation out the stack. Top view, 40 cells. Remember now, this is three football fields long. There's your tunnel train coming in. You do all the processing material leaves here. We can follow the airflow, but all the airflow through the building, through all these process facilities, goes out the stack. 
Aren't there any filters? I think filters were added later. Now I know, um, let's see if I, you know, I know there's some Hanford people in the room. <laughs> Maybe they can help me out. I don't think there was much filtering in the beginning. I know there were later, and later means a couple years later. They used some water scrubbers? No, it wasn't water scrubbers. It, um, I've read so much. Let's see if I can come up with it. Um, I don't think I can, but, but there was a lot of filtering. I think there was an ion exchange method of filtering, but I can't remember the others. Because nowadays, you probably wouldn't want to do this. I like this just because it has dimensions. Uh, 77 feet tall, 66 feet across, so you just, you know, most houses on lots and anacortes, you know, 60 feet, right? So that's how big this is. This six foot thick concrete to make sure the operators don't get too much radiation. And then the crane, if they're gonna like do some maintenance in this cell, this crane comes, pick up these blocks, moves them, and then the, you can actually change out equipment and change connections with this crane. But nobody can be here. There is a crane operator here behind concrete, and they all do that remotely. So I like this picture because this is inside the facility and there's enough light you can sort of see what's going on. So I would be in the crane cab right here. The crane would go this way, the cab would be here. So you don't have direct contact with the radiation. These are the blocks, so that they need to get in here and change a uh, centrifuge. They pull these blocks, they could reach down, pull out the centrifuge after they disconnected it, put in a new one or whatever maintenance they have. And then this is the hot process piping where the bad stuff comes in and out. All shielded by concrete. I'm gonna fast forward to um, one of the real uh, what we're we gonna do moments. Now concrete's a really good material. My boss was a civil engineer and he told me, you know, concrete hardens for 100 years and before it starts deteriorating. Now, okay, I believe it. And I believe it, I mean, concrete's tough. I've done a lot of work with it. But after that, it starts losing strength. And if you have any cracks and water gets in and rebar, corrosion, expansion, I think in five or 600 years, that roof's gonna collapse. That's just me talking. But I'd worry about that. How much radiation is contained in that concrete now, though? Enormous. Yeah, sorry. Um, removing some equipment, which is good, take it to more secure locations. I'm all for that. These are the operators. Sorry for the quality, but it's, these are hard to get good pictures of these. These are the operators with periscopes because you can't look directly at anything. So these are periscopes, mirrors. This would be on top, the crane would be up here, and it would be, for example, picking this up or working on this. You can see the block of the crane, whatever this is, removing it from one of those 40 cells. So, so that first half of the talk was on the intended consequences. We wanted to build bombs, but that's how we got our plutonium. We're happy. But there's unintended consequences. So in all the reading I do on the development of the weapons, you can't read a lot about, well, how are we going to clean it up? You don't really see a lot on that. A lot of people talk about the history and we produced this many grams of plutonium, we did all this stuff, but what about the waste? And the unintended consequences is these folks, which is these people in the room, are gonna to have to deal with that. When I, when I was on my first tour, they didn't give it on the second tour, a guy to Manhattan Project in Washington State. And this picture came out of that book. 
So where's all this big threat that I'm insinuating? <clears throat> Liquid released to the water and ground. Atmospheric releases, which then can go to the ground. This might be Spokane. Inhalation by wildlife, people, direct exposure through animal products, through crop, shoreline exposure, food, fish. So that's the potential exposure. So, five? Yes. How many people have been exposed? Um, let me probably not answer that <laughs> because I probably couldn't begin to answer it. But, but I have some interesting stuff later. I'm a Washington State Cougar. If I didn't have this shirt on, I'd have my Washington State Cougar shirts on, right? So this is Washington State Magazine, spring 2013. Anyone that would like a copy of this, I will, maybe one of our vannas could give it to whoever wants it. So let me just, let me just grab one here. Um, it's a little hard to see. Just sit here. But this is just a description of the potential problems we might have. Reverse wells, that's where they intentionally put material down. You've got underground tanks, pits, trenches, and landfills. So you'd actually just take barrels of stuff and bury it. Or you dig it, you know, and there might be, these might be huge. Um, yeah, cribs, ponds, trenches, and ditches. Dig a ditch, pour the liquid in. And then under the reactors themselves is highly radioactive and the chemical processing plants are extremely radioactive. Everything's fine as the product is in the Vados, and I probably didn't pronounce that right, but the Vados zone. But if it ever gets down into the water table, then that's a direct freeway to the Columbia River. Now there are traces that have made it into the Columbia River. But later on in the talk you'll see in the five chemical processing buildings, I don't see a way that they are going to be mitigated. I simply don't see it. And on these tanks, holy cow, how are we going to clean these tanks up? So we'll talk about that here in a minute. So did anybody want a copy of this, Washington State? I guess you're passing them around. Thank you. So this, just information I've accumulated, they have trenches, ponds or swamps, caverns, cribs and field tiles, so they would distribute low level, low level radiation this way. But there's a lot of them. Okay, so here's the one that's, that really opens people's eyes and that's the tanks. So you've got, I think it's 177 tanks, most of them single shell. This is a tank farm. These are big tanks, like half a million to a million gallons each. And they're filled with radioactive muck. If you have a double shell tank, you at least have a chance. You can tell when it begins to leak and you have a chance to do something, although somebody tell me what you're gonna do. But single shell tanks are bad. When they leak, they leak. If that tank leaks here, what are you going to do? Now, I've never heard this said, but I'm going to tell you a failure mechanism. I, I have actually never heard this. So this is a Bud original that 20 years from now, you, you can say, hey, I went to a meeting and I remember he said that. So when I worked at tanks at the refinery, you worried about a lot of things. You worried, you know, the first part that corroded was usually the floor and then the sidewalls, but don't forget the roofs. And you had to have special permits to go on tanks because people were worried, in some cases, that the roof would collapse. So what really worries me, when you have these tanks filled of all this 
gunk and acid and base for 70 years, you're going to get corrosion. I think they're going to lose an entire tank top. That's the idea you've heard here first. I think you're going to drop a whole tank top. And it's going to go in that liquid, take a bucket of water and a plate of steel and drop it in the water and see what happens. You are going to have the biggest mess you ever saw in your life. And tell me why this tank top won't fail. It's surrounded by earth, covered with eight feet of earth. It's corroding today. Is, is it steel? Steel. Yeah. The steel will corrode so many mills per year. And that's going to be external corrosion. But what I'd worry more about is the internal corrosion. We already know that quite a few of them are leaking. So we already know they've corroded through the bottom. <clears throat> There's a lot of weight here. When this steel, enough of that circumference is eaten away, that top's coming down. But they know what's in those tanks? Um, I'll try to answer that the best I can. Yes and no. It, it's not a material. It's a whole range of gunk. Plutonium, uranium, nitric acid, metals. Um, they have, they've actually have partially cleaned up. I think it's the first batch. I think it was nine tanks. But they can only pump them out so far, and then they get to this gunky sludge at the bottom, and they just give up. They just stop. Yeah, I've heard that. They don't know for sure what's in each tank. No, they don't. Well, they don't. You know, you can do sampling, but it's it's a real mess. They didn't inventory as it went in. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I don't know. So these are all the tanks. So let's see. Between 43 and 44, 149 single shell tanks were built. Okay, so here's... Here's the blues, all the different tanks. The green is the double shell. You can see in the 200 West area, the T, the first ones, these are all single shell tanks. Uh, if they pumped out the liquid, then would the sludge that remains uh, go anywhere? <clears throat> Solids? would not. Any liquids would tend to go to the, would tend to seep to go to the bottom, right? If, if you have a bucket full of rocks or whatever, liquids, it's going to try to get through to the bottom. So the, the danger, the real danger here is any water infiltration from the top, rain. Now, fortunately, I think they only get is it either six or eight inches of rain in eastern Washington. That's really good. Because if it was Western Washington, you've got a, a really strong driving force. So that builds in a lot of time safety, which is good. However, we're talking thousands of years. And is that liquid going to stay there for thousands of years, or is it going to get into the sand? What was it they were going to vitrify? They, well, ideally, <clears throat> you take a tank and pump the entire tank out to the vitrification plant and vitrify all that material. That's ideally, in theory. That's what you'd want to do. And then you'd want to take that material to the National High Level Waste Repository in Yucca Mountain, except of course that's never been opened. So just some gee whiz stuff as I was going through some of my material. Here's trench length by barrel ground in miles. So, sorry about this, but um, if you went to the 218 W2, you've got two miles of trench where radioactive material was put in the ground. You have a total of 45 miles of trenches. Uranium inventory by burial in kilograms. So you've got 400,000 kilograms of uranium in this trench and 2.2, so you've got about over 800,000 pounds. Plutonium, which is the nasty boy, nasty, nasty, 
In these trenches, kilograms, here's the plutonium you have. And um, I ran across an article this afternoon on why plutonium is so bad. And I'll try to summarize it. Um, I mean, any radioactive material is bad, but plutonium is bad, not so much on the outside, but it, it's, if you ingest it. it. The body is very susceptible to plutonium. It's kind of like, I'm going to say like lead. You know, if you take lead in, really bad, right? Well, plutonium's the same thing. If it, if it gets in your body, you're in real trouble. So when they had the railroad tunnel collapse, does anybody remember that about three years ago? And so they, they had everybody um, shelter in place, and they told them, don't eat or drink anything. Because you, know, you don't want to get any plutonium in. And if you do, you know, it's a serious health risk. So leaving that facility, um, this is the burial ground for every United States of America submarine nuclear reactor and warship. And this is an early picture because there's not very many of these here. But you can see the submarine. This is actually cut out of the submarine. I thought that was kind of clever. I'm sorry, but they don't have warheads. Say it again, sir. They don't have warheads in those. I didn't say that. Oh, I, I'm oh if I did, I, these are the reactors. Yeah, protection. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean. I misunderstood. Oh, I'm sorry. I probably said it. That, I'm sorry. No, these are, if I said warheads, holy cow. No. No. no, these are the reactors. But when a submarine reactor life is over, they, they actually apparently cut, cut that out of the submarine. And I actually know a person that works on the crane crew. It's a big deal. They bring them out by barge, and then they offload them on these huge moving, you know, multi-wheel moving vehicles, and they bring them in here. Now, I've got a Google map a few years ago, but this indicates, I don't know how many, maybe 30 or 20, and, and it's, you, you guys remember the number, it's well over 100. So the round ones are submarines, the rectangular ones would be like a cruiser or something like that. But this is the barrier grounds for those. But there are so many of them in the deep trenches in the ocean that the Russia and the U.S. don't. This is not all of them. Okay, and that could be. I just, yeah. no, this is on our tour, this is what we saw. Um, I don't want to, I've got handouts of this, so you can take it if you want, but there's, these are interesting summaries. Uh, most people acknowledge 56 million gallons of high-level radioactive waste in 177 tanks. A third of leaked, all are beyond their design lives. 28 of the tanks are double shell, 149 are single shell. So these are just gee whiz facts about that. Down here, in addition, the waste inside the tanks, waste deliberately discharged to the soil, 120 million gallons of waste. So we've got the tank waste, we have the waste that was dumped on the soil, we have the five processing plants. You have a bunch of other plants like the plutonium finishing plant. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of others, but the five processing plants worry me because they're so massive. They're so, you know, huge concrete, huge. So how do you cut that up? You know, how do you, how do you mitigate that? And it's not clear to see how you do that. Well, I'm amazed that they would just pour it into the ground. How do you recover that? How do you secure it? Um, what, what you're relying on, first of all, it's, it's lower level waste that they did that, primarily. And they counted on the fact that the ground is fairly impervious. And that's what they did. But it, it's, you saw my slide of the trenches and cribs. I mean, that's what they did. Because you know, if you don't have tank space, what do you do? because it's really important to have nuclear weapons. You might rethink that if it was really important to do that. Another G whiz, but I, I won't go through the whole thing. Um, this is the philosophy of the waste treatment plant to vitrify the material. There's issues of cost and time.
The latest effort, oh, they started the plan, I think, 2001, the vitrification plan, I think it was 2001. It was estimated to cost $4 billion. And it was to be operational 2019. That's what Congress was told. When we were there, we saw the plan. It didn't done. I saw a lot of cranes there. No sides on the building, many floors to go. It's not done. It's not even close. USA Today. I have copies for people interested in this. January 2012. I'll just read a couple paragraphs. This front page, by the way. The U.S. government is building a treatment plant to stabilize and contain 56 million gallons of waste left from a half century of nuclear weapons production. The radioactive sludge is so dangerous that a few hours of exposure could be fatal. A major leak could contaminate water supply serving millions across the Northwest. The cleanup is the most complex and costly environmental restoration ever attempted. The project is not going well. The plant's $12, million, $12 billion price tag already tripled the original estimates. So remember in 2001 it was $4 billion. 2012, it's 12 billion, is well short of what it will cost to address the problems and finish the project. And the plant's startup date, originally slated for last year, last year, 2011, startup date, pushed back to 2019. Now, Congress thinks it's 19, but USA Today says, and it's likely to slip further. Well, the last slide will show that it's slipping further. Interesting article. It's, it's a fascinating read, but it, if you read this, it just states that we're in a mess. Here's a head technical person of URS Corp. I've never seen this sort of flagrant disregard for technical issues. Oh, sorry, I wanted to go back here. So remember my numbers, 2001, Congress is told four billion. It's going to work in 2019. And then in 2012, 12 billion. In two, so here's the Department of Energy who's responsible for Hanford. Life, life cycle, scope, schedule, cost. The current Hanford budget's about two and a half billion a year. I think it goes up and down quite a bit. In 2016, these people told Congress that the best case for Hanford be you'd spend $103 billion to finish this project. They didn't give a timeline. The worst case, it'd be $107 billion, and you'd finish it in 2066. That's the vitrification of the material we're talking about. That was given to Congress in 2016. Three years later, 2019, the best case is we're gonna spend 323 billion and we'll finish the project in 2079. But the worst case, if things just don't go well, it'll cost $677 billion and we'll be all done in 2102. 
So we go from 4 billion, 2019, to this. Now, I tend to get cynical. I'm sorry, I'm cynical. I just can't imagine what they're gonna tell Congress in 2022. Okay, so I'll get, I'm now going to divert and just give you a one personal opinion. We're pretty much at the end of my talk. Is I don't see the solution. I simply do not see the solution. I don't see on those canyons how, how they're going to manage the canyons. It just, I don't see it. So when the railroad tunnel collapsed, what they did is they just filled it full of concrete. Okay. So how long is that going to last? And then, once you try to cut that concrete up, just think of all the dust and the debris. I mean, it's just an impossible job. I think we're digging ourselves in a hole, and we're not going to get out of it. Most worried about the tanks, the liquid, and the liquid goo, and the sludge, and the plutonium. And I worry about those tank roofs collapsing. And boy, oh boy, when that happens, everybody's going to be running for cover. Thank you so much. So I'm happy to answer some questions. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a few comments. First of all, thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, that was very well done. I um, have been fascinated by nuclear stuff for a long time, so it's funny. <laughs> and my dad, if you ever see a photo of um, Hiroshima post-bomb, mm -hmm. he um, was born in 28, and he was a photographer who was in the Army, and he, they put him on a plane, and he took those pictures of Hiroshima. So that picture you showed was probably taken by my dad. I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> I want to get into the family archives. <laughs> and um, after Fukushima, I was yeah. by Fukushima yeah. and following that closely, and apparently the top nuclear scientist in the world at the moment is Canadian. And he has said there is no mitigation of anything nuclear. And he said the whole West Coast is being contaminated as we speak from Alaska down deep into California coastal lines. And he said it's a huge cover up. And he's predicted that by the year 2030, the entire West Coast will need to be evacuated due to a buildup. And then it's not being talked about, and that we're eating contaminated food right now. That we were all radiated when Fukushima, when California got it the worst. And when you follow what happened in the air, Florida got the most contamination based on the current, the air currents. Um, but the water, um, the air, the ocean is all contaminated. That's why so many sea life you read about it once in a while are have these horrific tumors and it's from radiated water. And Fukushima, so I look at this and I'm just horrified by all this, and based on what I read from that scientist too, I mean, we have over 100, we have 101 nuclear reactors today in the United States, and it's horrifying. They're everywhere. And um, the other thing is in Fukushima, he said there's no way to stop it, what's going on over there, and they're dumping 300 tons of water a day to the Pacific. So the Pacific, he predicted, will be dead. That's his nuclear scientist. And eventually, it'll be all through the oceans of the world because there's no stopping it. So I mean, God, talking about annihilation of our species, it's one one nuclear plant is going to kill the Pacific. So and we have 101 in the United States. Simply not true, I'm sorry. Okay. We'll talk about that later. Okay. okay. All right. So, but I, I think the issue, well, you talk about not true. And let's, you know, I really don't want to get into the muck. But if anybody wants to read about the Green Run, take a copy. And this is when they intentionally release radioactivity at Hanford. Intentionally. Didn't tell anybody. If you lived in Spokane, you're just out of luck. If you read this, you won't believe a human being could do this. You won't believe it. They intentionally released a significant amount of radiation to test instrumentation so that they could detect a Russian nuclear explosion because they had this great instrumentation. So, again, I, it's easy to bog this down, but if you read this, you'll become a believer. 
in some of these stories. And what year was that? 1949. Does anybody want a copy? Yeah. Okay. It, it's a good read. And just and just for fun, if we have doubters, just Google Green Run. It's really interesting. Sir, Tony. Yeah, I I did a couple articles on the Green Run for a newspaper 25 years ago. I, friends of mine and I, because I was born and raised there, we would work over on the, the Pasco side in the hay in the hay or different things in the okay. summertime. And I know that um, three of the farmers that we worked for uh, died of thyroid cancer because it was uh, radioactive iodine that was released. Yeah, iodine-131 yeah. preferentially attacks the thyroid. My sister's husband dead and brother dead at a young age. Thank you. Go, go ahead and finish. That was it? Okay, but yes. They, lived, they were babies in Hanford. Sir, are they? Is, is there any? Uh, are there any active reactors still? Yes, one. Hanford? One now. So all the original ones, the plutonium production guys, they're down. I believe Whoops has got one still operating, and it's a very large. I think it's a 1,200 megawatt plant, and the purpose of that is to make electricity. electricity yeah. I think the, the first Whoops. I think that's the only one that ever worked. I think. Does, doesn't it still create ha a nuclear hazardous waste? Oh, absolutely. And another gee whiz fact is there's no place for this waste to go. So if you're in California, you have a nuclear plant, one of your 101, and it's time to refuel, they, the fuel stays at the plant because there's no place to ship it. And our friend Reed in Nevada, he hasn't taken any waste in the... In the uh, National high-level waste for Osbury. Nope, it didn't take many. So everybody's stuck. There's no place for this stuff to go. Is there any safe place for us to go? Um, you know, I, I think the safe place is. You know, to me, this is like global warming or whatever. It's going to be a grassroots. People have to just be concerned and worried. I think we can solve the problem if we put the priority into it. This is this place. If you read about this, this is a technological masterpiece. I mean, they built Hanford in just a few years, knowing very, very little about plutonium and chemistry. I mean, it's a phenomenal achievement. What I think the solution is see, everybody thinks I'm against Hanford. No, I'm for Hanford. We shouldn't be spending two and a half billion dollars a year, we should be spending 250 billion dollars a year. Every major university should be given billions, study it, try to figure it out, do something. How do you mitigate it? We should be spending billions and billions, every knowledgeable person trying to solve this problem. That's what I think the solution is. And if we don't, and we won't, then I think we're in for it. An earthquake. Yeah, that was the other thing I was thinking. Oh, yeah. Some of the, uh, if there's a big one. Their plants are on the earthquakes. Good luck. But again, the tank groups. Um, why, why do they need so much plutonium if it only takes oh, one and a half gram? Okay. Come, come November 4th, Four. because I, I looked at the numbers today on the plutonium inventory. It's unbelievable. First of all, they shut the reactors down, not because they're good old boys or they're smart. They got so much of this stuff, they can't use it. And plus, you know, it took this much plutonium to make a bomb now, it takes this much, right? I mean, they, I, I, I shouldn't tell you the numbers because I can't remember, but I mean, it's tons of, just thousands of tons of plutonium. But November 4th, we'll have those numbers. Tony. Yeah, it's interesting, all this information, because when I grew up there, that you, you, your slide showed Highway 240. Well, that was completely out of balance until I was a freshman in college. Yeah. Um, none of this information, and I mean none of it, was available. And if you asked questions about it, you were looked on suspiciously. Uh, so, you know, this place provided jobs for people who fled the Depression. And <clears throat> most of the working class there was 
Appalachian, Southern, or Lower Midwest. Um, people who have been hit especially hard by the Depression. So this got them a house, a couple of cars, motorhome. So it was just impossible in that environment to, to question anything that was going on in Hanford. Um, and again, there was no information available, and people who worked there were not supposed to talk about what was going on. Thank you, Tony. In the back. Okay. So, you know, you read a lot about um, cleanups. You know, they're cleaning up this, they're cleaning up that, and they're, you know, supposedly have this big cleanup plan going on at Hanford uh, and some of the other uh, bad sites around the country, but you know, I don't, to me it just seems like you're not, you're not cleaning anything, you're just moving it from one place to another, it seems like. I mean, you, how do you, how do you clean, I mean, how do you clean up, you know, this stuff? I mean, like you say, I mean, it's, maybe this process you're talking about, you know, is, is, a, is a potential way to, to at least contain it. Sure. So it can't, you know, get sure. out. But, you know, there's so much damage been done already in terms of it getting into the ground and things like that. It's only a matter of time until it's in the Columbia River heavily yeah. enough to where it really starts causing really serious problems. But I don't, I don't get this term clean up. What does yeah. that really mean? I, actually, I, I enjoyed that comment here because I agree with it totally. Is um, I think the concept of gentrification is solid as a concept. And I, I would only hope, I mean, that's the only thing I can see, again, not with the current rate, but with accelerated rates of research. Because if it is in a solid form, I could see it being transferred every 500 years from this lead box to a bigger lead box. I mean, I could just see that happening. But other than that, I, I agree with you. This I'd like to visit next. Uh, I had an uncle who worked at a Las Vegas building wooden houses at the test site and they'd blow them up and the next day the crew would go out and build some more for the next mm -hmm. the next explosions in their testing and he died very early in life but, uh, and most of the people did i think and he was a carpenter and uh, I, at the time i thought why are they doing that you know, he was still young and uh, they were going out there and blowing these things up and testing, seeing what happened to these structures with the small uh, bombs they were using at that time for the above ground. And then they went underground, but uh, you know, they got much bigger for the underground testing. So, yeah, and we'll, thank, thank goodness we're not doing an, uh, above, uh, ground. above ground tests. I think there was 923 or something yeah. in the Nevada desert. Um, and, oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just One of the things that I've always believed in life is when you finally realize you're in a hole, quit digging. Well, you know, and we're still building yeah. these things. <laughs> Please, everyone that thinks the same way, get on our email list. On uh, are there other questions? So on November fourth, I'd love to see you all. Bring some of your friends. We will. Um, talk about some more interesting stuff. I have one last yes. question. Yes, Judy. Were you concerned at all, Jackie and Bud, you're in the room when there was uranium? Yeah. Um, I mean, weren't you? Well, actually, probably to answer that, no. It's kind of like, you know, driving down the road, right? I mean, are you concerned? No. I mean, I, I'm kind of a little bit of a risk taker, you know, so I, I guess I wasn't. But, you know, I worked at the refineries, didn't bother me at all. And now I look back and I think, wow, you know, there, was, there were some close calls. I mean, close calls, right? And when you, you know, I could talk more about that. But, so, no, it didn't bother me. And they, you know, there's a lot of monitors there. And I'm sure if there's high level, somebody blows a whistle and you, you head to the bus. Um, but there probably wasn't, there wasn't much of a chance of anything like at the end reactor. Now, what could happen at any time, when they're driving, and that, but I, I lo enjoyed the tour, I loved it. We sat, we, we were this close to the tea plant. Couldn't believe it, this close. The bus, remember that? And the first tour they didn't do it, the second one they did. But you go through the tank farms and stuff, 
On the first tour, they didn't on the second, but on the first tour I saw where the tunnel collapsed, because you, you could see where it was. You could see where they filled it up and mounted it up. Um, but if, if one of those tanks burps, you know, gets a bunch of hydrogen in it, blows, now that doesn't happen, but if, if it does, oh yeah, I mean, we could, that could have been our last bus ride, right? <laughs> Did they tell you about the hydrogen problem? Um, I read, I read, actually in this USA Today. Okay, let me comment on that, and then Dick, who actually knows ten times more than I do, and probably should have given this talk. I'm interested in that, but what I read today was in the vitrification process. They're worried about. You don't want to accumulate so much plutonium that you get a reaction. Or you accumulate hydrogen and it blows up. I read that today. So are you in no, no, I was talking about hydrogen generation in the tanks. This was a huge problem. Um, some of those tanks were, I, I don't want to steal the thunder here, but no, some no, of those please, tanks, please. <laughs> some of those tanks, uh, were so hot, you know, from radioactive decay that they needed refrigeration. I mean, the stuff was boiled just from radioactive decay, so they had to cool it. In the process, it would hydrolyze water, and, and, and hydrogen and oxygen would fill the tank. And the problem was, they were afraid they were going to have, as the Russians did, in one of their tanks, the hydrogen flows and just blows the whole top off the tank yeah. and breathe. Yeah, thank so you very much. That. Yeah, Dick, and actually, Dick, I was half tempted to call you because I know you are a local expert, but I didn't want to put you on the spot. I talked to another person that's a local expert, and he actually re refused, not because he knew the subject, but they've got all these confidentiality agreements. They can't say anything. No. You know, they're just bound and gay. So I didn't call you. Otherwise, I would have. But but I'd like to finish that comment. Here it is, USA Today, there's the tank, and it's all these issues, erosion, nuclear reaction, fear factors, uh, extraction, transportation, waste, hydrogen buildup. Hydrogen gas generated by the reaction of radioactive particles could be trapped by solids in the waste and build up, creating a risk of a small explosion, which is what you talked about in the tank. Not small. <laughs> yeah, not, well. <laughs> Did they tell you what they're planning to do with these vitrified waste? Once they yes, the vitrified waste is all to be transported to Yucca Mountain, which is the permanent, long-term, high-level nuclear waste storage facility that they poured no, billions in, and it's not open for business. They're still saying that even though Yucca Mountain shut down? Harry Reid says that. He's the only one that says that. Says what? No one's going to use Yucca Mountain oh, in his state. It's pretty much. Harry Reid? Harry Reid? <laughs> Harry Reid? Oh, yeah. Harry Reid decides if, uh, what is it, 83% of every American would like background checks. There's only one per, there's two people stopping that. I won't mention yeah. the first one. The second one and is Harry Reid. That's the only reason we don't have that. Harry Reid. Harry Reid shut down Yucca Mountain. Would it be safe to even transport it there? If it was vitrified, and again, remember, I'm against this stuff, right? I think it would be. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it's one of the few hopes we have, because it's like, if you don't do it, then what do you do? Um, I think they made a mistake at Hanford being so close to the Columbia River. Well, they needed the water. Well, I'm okay. So let's say you're going to do this. Okay, your reactors are there. But those processing plants, holy cow. Not by the Columbia River. Yeah. Is the reason why you can't dump the vitrified blocks into the, the deepest trenches in the ocean is because they'll break down in the ocean? Actually, I don't know the answer to that. And, and so, I, I mean, I'm just not an expert. It, that might be. That might be something to do. So here's the good and the bad of that. The good of that, you got this block, assuming it's more dense than water, it goes to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. I don't know what's going to happen in 5,000 years. Well, we care about it. Please. 
we studied that at great length. <laughs> and the answer was that if you put the stuff in a penetrator, like a, like a bomb, you know, with a, you know, so it with fins, and drop it in the ocean over the Atlantic adduction zone, that's where the Earth is right now going down, it would bury it, I forget the speed, but really going fast by the time it hit the bottom, it would bury itself deeply in the mud at the bottom, and eventually go to the center of the Earth, away from everybody. You can imagine how far that went. Not in my ocean, you know. <laughs> that, that's why I wish Dick gave his talk. <laughs> I would have loved to have worked out there just to be an information gatherer. <laughs> I appreciate everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>